Hi, how you doing? I am Scott Robert Lim, and I'm here today to talk about something very exciting and revolutionary uh, about continuous lighting and where technology is going and how you can use it in your workflow and how it can make your life easier and more creative. A photographer is only as good as their weakest link. Okay, so I don't know how many out you there uh, out there feel like, you know what, sometimes I go out on my sessions and I'm just killing it. And then other times you go out and it's like, oh man, I just couldn't get in a groove today. Right, and you feel this up and this down and sometimes it depends on the model and sometimes it depends on the lighting situation that you weren't prepared for maybe and we're constantly going up and down. Um, with our work. Well, if you want to be consistent with your work and if you want to start to create a signature style, you're going to have to kind of learn the fundamentals of each of these four things. Composition, the way you compose your photo, where you put the subjects, what you choose to shoot in your background and so forth. Uh, that's very, very important because without great composition, you're not, your photos won't have impact because all the detail in the background may just kind of lose the focus of your photo. And even the way you crop it affects your composition too. So all of that uh, takes a while to learn. Then on top of that, you're going to have to learn uh, about your posing skills. Uh, how to pose the subject is very important taking control of the situation. Uh, if you have a bride and groom and know how to pose couples, knows how, how to pose families, know how to pose uh, you know, females, males, all that kind of thing. Uh, that again, you want to take control of the situation and posing is very important. Lighting skills, you've got, and that's what we're talking about today. Lighting creates mood, cr lighting creates impact, and that's so, so, so very important to your photos. And the last one actually, is post-processing. And so nowadays, just shooting it uh, and handing it over, if you want to kind of put yourself and give yourself a signature style, the way you edit the photos are very huge. And I know if you go online to a lot of uh, Instagrammers, they have actually a lot of the popular Instagram um, influencers or photographers have a set style of post-processing that's kind of unique to them. And they actually have YouTube videos explaining how these photographers um, edit their photos and create that signature style. So I see post-processing not as kind of fixing things or what I say like polishing a turd, but what post-processing to me is about is extending your vision. And that's really what all this is about, is to be able to extend your vision. Now, if you don't have all four of these things lined up, what's going to happen to you is, let's say you're in a situation and you have to use flash. And you're, oh, I'm not sure about the flash. Uh, I can't get, wait, the, the channel has to be what? How do I set my channel again? Ah, you're just freaking out, right? And so all your energy is, oh, how do I get this flash to work? How much of that creative energy do you have now paying attention to your subject, being able to pose them, being able to put them in the right place and all this kind of stuff, right? Because what happens is, is if you're so consumed of just trying to jump over a hurdle, that leaves you no room to be creative at all. Because all your energy is problem solving. So when you get to the point where you're going to do a shoot and you go, okay, I know exactly where I'm going to put the model there. I know I'm going to use constant light. I'm, I'm going to use this lens. I'm going to pose it this way. Bam. If you know that already, like the back of your hand, now you can finally be creative. But if all your energy is sucked up with just problem solving, you're never going to get to that point where you're going to have a signature style. So, all things have to flow first, and it takes forever. It takes you a few years to learn each one of these. I've been shooting for 20 years, and I still feel like, you know what? I still have plenty of room to grow in each of these areas. 
Uh, so it's a never ending process, but if you really, really want to grow the fastest, the best and the fastest way to get good is actually to be mentored, right? I mean, you can watch tons of videos, which are awesome, but can a video look at your work and say, hey, you're doing great in this area, but you need work in that area? No, right? There's no two-way communication. And so if you feel like you're kind of just getting stuck and you're not progressing to that next level, you really have to get coaching. Uh, you really have to get mentoring to get you to that next level because just watching a bunch of videos or coming to workshops uh, that are one-way information probably won't do it for you. All right, so anyways, let's talk about lighting now. So those are the four fundamentals. Let's talk about lighting and let's talk about uh, run and gun lighting with constant light, okay? So here's my motto, least amount of gear, maximum utility. Lightweight, portable, and fast. I started my career as a wedding photographer and um, that's what we had, it, you know, you, you're doing everything with wedding photography. You're uh, being a photojournalist, you're doing portraiture, you're doing uh, detail shots, you're, like, you're doing commercial, you're doing everything. And you have to do everything like in 60 seconds. And so, and you can't carry your whole back of your station wagon or your van with you with all your gear all the time. You have to pack light, especially me. I did a lot of weddings internationally. So I had to keep it as, as lean as possible. So my whole career, I know B&H doesn't like to do this, but hear this. But my whole career is trying to use the least amount of gear as possible. But in the beginning of the, my career, I collected everything. Oh, yeah, maybe I need that. Buy it. Oh, yeah, that lens might be in hand, handy. Buy it. But as I get older and I start to, you know, understand uh, what I need, it's very few things I need, and I, and I can do everything by the least amount. And that's why I like this continuous lighting that I'm going to be talking about. It's because it's so easy to use, it's portable, it's lightweight, and you can get your imagery done really, really fast. So before we get started, let's talk a little bit about some light basics, okay? The qualities of light, how to create it, and when to use it. Because if you don't know how these basics first, then you're not really going to master your lighting or you're not going to really understand what you should buy and what you should not buy if you don't understand the basics and light in general, especially when shooting on location. So let's go over that first. Let's talk about light quality. Okay, so what is hard light versus soft light? You guys have been quiet out there. Now I want you guys to be, give me some energy, interact with me. Like, tell me, what's the difference between, anybody know, any, between hard light and soft light? Hard light is like a direct light. Hard light, she says, hard light is a direct light and soft light is diffuse. Okay, well, that's true to a certain extent, but it's that, that's not like the full definition of it. Anybody, yes? Um, I'm not sure if she's that far off, but hard light is like we're walking down the sidewalk, it's straight. It's straight and direct like light. Hitting, hitting a wall and bouncing. That would be your soft <laughs> Okay. Well, I think you're getting you're you're getting around to it, but what really creates hard light? So what creates hard light is the source of the light and how large it is. Okay? So you could have a direct light but it be a very, very large source, but be extremely soft. Have you ever shot like uh, in your natural surroundings where the light is coming through a door or coming through a huge window and it's super soft, right? Because the size is, is what makes it soft or what makes it hard. The characteristics of it is by the shadow, okay? So, if you have hard light, what type of shadow does it create? If you went outside right now, I think the sun's out there right now, no clouds in the sky, 
high up in the uh, high up in the sky and creating a shadow on the ground, what would it look like? Strong. Strong, but what about the edges? Sharp. Sharp. That's it. So hard light, you see a sharp shadow. Okay? Soft light creates softer shadows or more transition between the shadow and the highlight. It's softer. Okay? But how do you create that? Right? So what you can do is what you're alluding to is diffusing the light. What does that do? Or, or bouncing the light off the wall. That makes the light bigger. It's creating a bigger source, right? So if you had your flash and you're firing it up on the wall and having it come down, it would be very, very soft. I mean, I could actually demonstrate that right now, right? So if I had this light on and I turned it on, Right? And it was right at me. Let's turn this down some. If it's right at me, right, you see a kind of a sharp shadow there, right? But if I turned it up onto the ceiling and made it strong, now the light is bouncing up and coming back down on me larger and it's softer. The shadows are, are less uh, prominent or sharp, right? There's less contrasting. Okay? So, so you can make any light softer just by bringing it closer to your subject because the relative size of it actually becomes very big. So how you can tell um, the size is by just measuring it, okay? And so you could have a soft box. There, we have soft box all about the same sizes. But we could have a soft box that is this big, okay? And we could have another soft box, let's say, um, I'm trying to get something smaller here. Oh, you know what I have in line? Let's see. I have, uh, I was going to bring it out anyways. Let's see if I have it in my bag here. One thing I forgot to take out. Sorry, folks. I just want to show you the relative size so, um, uh, okay, here it is. Got it. Got it. All right, here we go. All right, so I have these pop up soft boxes right, that are pretty cool. All right, so we have a soft box this size, which is bigger than this size, which is going to create softer light. Well, it depends. It depends on the position of where this light is. So let's say I want you, what's your name? Deanne. Deanne. Okay, Deanne. With your, put your fingers right up to your eye about maybe an inch or so and measure the size of this softbox. Okay, so relative, now keep your finger there and don't move the distance to your eye. Keep it right there. Okay, so that size of this light is that big. Let's pretend that's hitting the back of the camera or wherever, hitting your subject, okay? Now, I could take, a, I could take this and I'm going to move in and tell me when this size matches that size, okay? Okay, so this smaller light will create the same type of light in terms of softness and quality by being closer even though it's smaller. Get it? So it's not only just the, it's not only just the size. Now one of the biggest mistakes that I see a lot of photographers do is that they have the light source too far from their subject. They just like, oh, I got plenty of power. I'm just going to place it out here. Well, yeah, you might have plenty of power, but you're not getting the full quality and softness of the light. So what I try to do is take these, these, uh, these are like smaller softbox, more portable. They're great for outdoors. But if I put that softbox right here, this close to my subject, you're going to get some incredible light. Okay? And so softness is not only by how it's diffused, but really the size of the light that's hitting your subject, okay? All right, so 
let's uh, move on from that. That's hard versus soft light. Okay, let's talk about, we talked about how and, and when to create soft light. No, oh, yeah, okay, so in here, for example, do you see any sharp shadows on the ground? No, right? Generally, in here, we have some very, very soft light. And indoors, generally, the light is soft because it's not like, you know, the sun is indoors and, and it's casting a bright light. But so, if I were to produce hard light on my subject in here, when it's soft light, people, people will look at the photo and go, ooh, that's, uh, that doesn't look right because it's not believable, okay? Believability is a huge, because you have to put soft light, if you have a soft light environment, you have to put soft light with it to make it believable. And that's why a lot of people say, I hate flash, it just is too yucky. Because a lot of times, but the on-camera flash, your on-camera flash, what's the source size of your on-camera flash? It's teeny weeny, right? It's not even this big. It's probably like half this big. So it's a very small source. And so if you measure it to your eye, it's always going to produce hard light if you're not going to diffuse it. And so you use, oh, here, I'm going to take a picture of you. Am I on camera flash? Boom. It's hard light. I'm in a soft light situation. It doesn't look great. You got to match your environment with your light. And then it will look awesome. Okay. So now, how do you create, we talked about um, soft light, how do you create hard light? Hard light, if you looked up, like, like the sun is a great example because when the sun shines, you're always going to see sharp shadows. Not unless it's going through clouds or it's being diffused in some way. But if it's straight and there's no clouds, then you're going to get hard light, you're going to get a sharp shadow all the time. Because if you look up at the sun and you were to measure how big it is to your eye, you'd probably go, it's about that big, right? So whenever you measure a light and go, oh, it's that big, it's always going to produce a sharp shadow. Okay? So if you're outdoors, it's what, is it hard or, or soft light? Okay. Hard light. So if I produce hard light, it's believable. And you can get away with it and not diffusing the light all the time. And so when I'm running and gunning and I'm using small light sources and I'm outdoors, a lot of times I'm not going to diffuse the light because if I'm in a bright light situation, if I diffuse it, that takes four times the power away from my light. And I might not have enough juice. So therefore, um, what I'll do is I'll just use hard light in a hard light situation. And it will look fine. We did that yesterday when we walked around, didn't we? Who was there, right? I showed it. I put, we put some soft light on our subject. I'll go, okay, take the diffuser off and let's, put, let's just go straight. And people are like, oh yeah, wow. That looks good too. I go, why? Because we're in a hard light situation. It's fine. So you have to know the situation is to use the correct lighting, okay? So believability, we talked a little bit about that. Uh, creating shadows. You need to get your light or learn to light things off camera. Okay? Because if you get the light off camera, it can create shadows on your subject. Why are shadows so important? Why do we need shadows? That's right. It creates depth because photography is two-dimensional. So how do you know anything when you look at a photo, if you're looking at it at a flat screen, how do you know anything has dimension? The only way you know something is rounded or there's shape to it is that if there's shadow. If you don't see shadow, you don't see shape. Is shape important to photography, being able to see shape? Of course it is. You're, you're taking a, a picture of a woman and a, a bride. Let's say she's a bride and she's been working out every single day for a whole year. She's the, in the best shape of her life. Does she want to see her shape? Yes. We have to show it, right? And a lot of how we do that is with shadow, especially with our face. If we see, now, 
Some people have very prominent features, but some people have very subtle features like myself. I have to, you know, when people want to take pictures of me, I demand that they put shadow on my face when they shoot it, short side shadow. So you can see the, 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 the curve of my cheekbones and, and so forth. What do you think makeup does? What is makeup? Makeup is basically putting shadows on them, but painting it on instead of using light, they, they color their face. Why? Because they want to create the effect of what light can do, a shadow. Right? That's why they put the rouge on and the highlight. I don't even know the terms of it, but, you know, that's what they do. All I know is when you know, they put the makeup on, wow, looks great, right? And that's what people do. People, like when they go out and shoot now, here's the big thing. Oh, I'm going to get them styled up. I'm going to have them great makeup. That man, that gives you a free pass. Because you don't have to do anything at that point. The makeup is the lighting. They look good already. I'm going to shoot it at 1.2. I'm just going to blur the background out. I don't have to worry about anything coming out of her head or whatever and just shoot it. Boom. It looks amazing. Wow. You're going to get a thousand likes on your Instagram. Right? But does it take skill, right? Less skill. But, and so sometimes I'll shoot, shoot subjects and they're not wearing any makeup at all but you can make them look good by the shadow that you put on their face when they shoot it and that's all about using off-camera light that's why it has to be off-camera all right so creating shadows is very important and you have to do that and so the type of shadow whether it's a hard shadow or it's a soft shadow you can control that by the softness and hardness of the light okay but here's the this cool thing soft light is king Soft light wins, hands down, every single time when you're shooting a portrait. And so what you try to do, I know sometimes you have to, I mean, you can do some hard light effects, and, but by and far, if you're shooting somebody and you want to make money from it and you want it to have that professional look, then you, you have to have soft light on your subject and learn how to create it, okay? All right, so let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about our environment, okay? Someone was, yeah, question. How do you create soft light in a hard light situation? Oh, you just diffuse the light and make it bigger. I'll have you move the sun out of the way. No, but you, oh, you're not using the sun. You're using your own light. The sun is there. The sun is there, but you could put the sun behind them. Right? You could put the sun behind them. So, this gentleman has a good question. He's saying, well, if you're outdoors and it's hard light, how are you going to make soft light? Well, you don't have to use the sun as your main light all the time, okay? So if you don't use your sun as the main light, that means I, I have the opportunity to create my own light. And if I can create my own light, I could create soft light and I could be in control, okay? So we'll get into that. So. Here's the Sunny 16 rule. How many pe are, people are familiar with the Sunny 16 rule? Okay, the Sunny 16 rule, someone was real smart. And they said, you know what? Let me just measure how bright the sun gets. And if I know, because, you know, generally the sun is the same brightness every day, right? Is that correct? It depends on the season, but in general, this, let's just measure. The sun is so far away. Uh, that, it, that the, the light brightness is going to pretty much remain consistent because the Earth is so far away from the sun. Okay, that's a little bit of physics involved with that, right? So let's measure the brightest point when, when this Earth is. And somebody came up with the sunny 16 rule. So when you go out there and you see super sharp shadows on the ground, okay, first thing you do is if you put your ISO equal to your shutter, so if you're shooting at ISO 100, what would your shutter be? 100. You guys are brilliant. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Now, if you, okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, so, right, ISO 100, your shutter's 100. No matter what this is, right, no matter if it's 200 and 200, 400 and 400, 800 and 800, this rule still applies, okay, no matter what, all right? And so here's the first, the brightest point is F16. 
If you have your shutter to ISO 100, your, I mean your ISO is 100, your shutter is 100, and it's a bright shiny day, you can set your f-stop to f-16 and you'll get an ex uh, a, a good, a properly exposed picture. And so that's why people in the old days, they didn't have light meters. They would just look at the quality of the sun and then they, would, they could guess the metering with it. I, you know, and so you can do it. You could just walk around all day and try this method out and you will be correct, right? And you need to kind of understand how much light is needed. So F16, uh, F11, maybe the sun is going through some clouds or maybe it's kind of being clipped by some trees and being slightly diffused and you might see that sun with a blurry edge on it. That's F11. Okay, so each f-stop, it's half the light. So, so f11 is the next stop below f16. So f16, f11 is half the light that f16 is, okay? And so those are your typical bright light situations, okay? So then when you see overcast, right, that's like putting, uh, basically, you know what overcast is? Is you have a light source and you're putting it through an umbrella. It's the same type effect, right? You, you, you have some very diffused light. Uh, you don't see a lot of shadows, okay? And so there's slight or no shadows at all. And so that's uh, F8, okay? Then, then there's five, six, and what is that? That's when you're in the shade. So if you see somebody in the shade, you'd go, okay, I can put my, uh, I could put my aperture to 5.6 and you're pretty much going to be right on, okay? Then you have uh, dark shade, okay? That's F4. And then when it gets to be twilight, like when the sun just kind of goes below the horizon, then you're at 2.8, okay? And so now you could literally go outside and figure out the exposure no matter what, just by looking and understanding, oh, I'm in the shade, uh, but there's bright light out there. Okay, it's probably five, six. But let's say it's overcast, or it's, there's a lot of cloud coverage, and, and you go under some shade and it's dark, you might be at F4, right? But in general, you're gonna be correct, right? All right, so that's understanding the strength of light. Now, when you're sh in five, shooting at F16 in super bright light, I know this sounds kind of weird, but when you're in bright light taking a portrait, you need bright light on your subject. Does that make sense to you? So the brighter the light there is in the room or the, that you're experiencing, the brighter the light you need to create a portrait. Why is that? Anybody know? Well, if we had a very, very, very bright light, let's take, let's take this light and let's bust this up, okay? Now, this light creates a shadow, right? Now, let's say this shadow was very unpleasing and it was on the face. And so you didn't want to take a picture with this shadow on the face. You wanted to use your own light to take the shadow out. If it's super bright light like this, you need a real, you need a matching light to take the shadow out, right? So this light is super strong. If I shine this in the eyes, you'd be like, ah, why do that, right? It's super bright. It's like at 8,000 lumens. Could you get your iPhone out and turn on your light on your iPhone to get that shadow out? Anybody want to try it? What do you think? Do you think an iPhone light could take that shadow away? No, why? Because the iPhone light is so teeny weeny in, in regards to power, it's not the same power as this. Now let me ask you a question. Is the sun very bright? Yes! So we need power to match the sun in order for us to take a portrait in super bright light. You get it? So the stronger the light, the stronger the shadows, the stronger the light we need, especially human beings, because a lot of us, right, if the light is high, 
our eyes are inset, aren't they? And they create this thing called raccoon eyes, where because our eyes are inset and the light is high, there's a shadow over our eyes and it looks like we got two black eyes. And let's say we want to get that light out. The sun's very strong, right? We need a super strong light to get it out. That's why shooting outdoors is the most challenging thing because one, people don't understand how bright the sun is. I mean, even though it's bright in this room and you're walking around B&H, it's many, 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 many times stronger. It could be 10 times stronger outdoors. You know, and you can realize that when you when you were inside and then you walk outside and your eyes like, ah, I need to adjust. You can see it's strong. All right. So good. We got that out of the way. We understand the strength of light and let's get going. And so we can now I can understand different concepts and what light to use. Now that you know the strength that is needed, now you can know, OK, well, this light would work in this situation, but this light won't work in this situation. OK, so there's three types of lighting situations. OK, now I list all these here. Now let me give you, um, I break it up into the first group, F16, F11. That's bright, harsh, strong shadows that's very difficult to shoot in. OK, I don't wish that on anybody. That's why a lot of people, when they shoot in bright light, oh my gosh, it, you know, you're looking for shade. or you, Some people only shoot at sunset because the light gets softer at that point. Okay? Then the second situation is F8 or 5, 6 or 4. This is when it's overcast or you're in the shade. Okay? Now, that light can be very boring. Why is that type of light boring? What's that? There isn't contrast. Yes, there isn't contrast. Photography, and especially photography that I like, you want to see highlight and shadow. Do you ever see like a column and the sun is shining down low and you see this repetitive highlight shadow, highlight shadow? I love shooting in those situations when there's a lot of highlight and shadow or when the tree, right? You see the tree and the light's a little bit lower and you can see highlight and shadow from the leaves and things like that. That's what makes photography interesting is highlight and shadow. It defines shape, right? And so when you're shooting in overcast uh, weather, I, you know, you, you, oh man, I mean nothing's glary or you can shoot any direction because you don't have to worry about the sun. But the thing is, is sometimes the photos are really flat. Have you heard of that term? Oh man, it's really flat lighting. That means there's no shadow. That means there's no highlight and shadow. And sometimes at that point, we need a light strong enough to give us a highlight and shadow. So we have to overcome the existing light. And so we need to create a light brighter than the existing light so we can create a highlight and shadow in those particular cases. So that's why creating your own light in those particular cases is, is necessary because it looks a, a little bit boring. Okay, now here's the next one. Okay, right here, very low light. I would say that 80 to 90 percent, maybe even more, I would say 90 percent or more of the video lights could only give you enough strength to shoot in this situation, okay? So that's why video lights are not the first choice for people to get lighting. People say flashes are, right? Because flashes can create light at this strength. So that's why video lights or continuous light hasn't been a very popular because all it can do is just in this category. Yes? I'm changing it to change the depth of field. Yeah, okay. Well, we could talk about equivalence exposures too. So this is ISO, let's say here, this is ISO 100 and, and shutter speed 100 at F16. I could create the exact same exposure at 1.8 if I turn my shutter speed to 8,000. Okay? So the, you can always make an equivalent exposure, but 
I'm trying to give you a relative scale of how bright of a light that you need. So that's why I, I have to keep the shutter and the ISO the same so you can understand the relative strength of each at time. All right? So this area here is when the sun goes below the horizon if you're outdoors or, you, or you're indoors at any time, that's when you can use a video light. What's the light that's creating in this room right now? Video lights, right? Constant lights, because we're indoors. This one make a lick of difference if we're outdoors in the bright sun right now, okay? And so that's where the, the standard video lights, they all fell into this category here. But what I've been using and what I've been turned on to lately are these new lights, these revolutionary lights that could actually shoot into these categories. And it is really changing photography uh, because it's so much faster and easier to, 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 to light things that are constant, not a flash where it's momentary. Okay? When you can see the light, you can actually position it better. You know how soft it is because you can see the shadows. It's way faster constant light, but there hasn't been anything strong enough that you could take with you that's small that could penetrate these categories. Okay? But that's what I'm going to show today, and that's the exciting thing about today is because I'm going to show you now it's possible and it's going to make your life a lot easier, okay? So I love these lights by Light and Motion, and the ones that I use is the Stella 1000, which is this right here. And this actually is uh, 1,000 lumens, but for 45 seconds, it can burst to 2,500 lumens and then go back down. And so a lot of times that works for me because all I need is 40 seconds to take a portrait. And then when it goes back down, I'm cool. But I get that burst if I need it up to 2,500 lumens, which is cool. The other light that I use is the Stella 2000, and that's 2,000 lumens. And the light that I actually use the most, because I want to penetrate those other categories, right? The light, uh, situation um, well, one and two is this right here is the CLX-8, and the 8 stands for 8,000 lumens, okay? That, if you don't know lumens, that's where. Now most, the all, pretty much um, a great majority, I would say 90% of the video lights fall into the, the, these categories here, okay? There's really nothing like this light that's so portable and strong nothing on the market okay and so I love these lights because they're really durable okay the 1000 and the 2000 are completely waterproof so they can go down how many meters underwater 100 100 meters underwater okay so if you scuba dive or whatever but um, yeah so that's and they're really really they're made out of metal uh, they're uh, made in the USA, so they're, they're very, you can come up and touch them. I mean, they're like, feel that. That's like nicely built. That's like, wow, that feels nice, doesn't it? Who wants to touch it? Who wants to feel it? Yeah, go ahead. All right, and I, and I love these lights. Yes? What's the price range? Price range, well, it can go anywhere from around $300 to $1,200, $1,300 in there. So there's something for everybody in there. Very reasonably priced considering how much light they produce. Um, but guess what? For you, I got a special discount for you. At the end of the lecture, I'm going to give you a special discount. All right, so here's the three lighting situations. So in the category where there, it needs the least amount of light, you can use all three of those, right? The 1,000, 2,000, or 3,000. Now, and these are where most video lights stay. They can't get above this. Okay? Now you want to get on to shooting in overcast, shooting in open shade, right? You are going to need either the 2000 and you're going to need the um, 8000, okay? But if you really want to do some damage up in this area, which we used yesterday, right? And we did it, right? Yeah, I showed you yesterday on our walkabout that 
that light there is your really only option, okay? That can change your photography. It's so much easier to learn constant light than to learn flash. You could immediately buy this light, go out and start using it, and have success right away, right? Like I, I showed everybody yesterday, okay? And so those are the three, this is how I use them, and let's go some, over some examples of this, okay? All right, situation number one, bright, nasty, ugly light, F16, F11. This is when the sun is the strongest, okay? So I went out there, this is actually um, near Monterey, uh, a Sony condo event was there. And I said, you know what, let's go out in the worst lighting conditions possible. And that's what we did, right? The sun was super high, there's not much cloud coverage, the shadows were sharp, there were sharp shadows on the ground, right? And let's go shoot it, and let's test these lights out and see what it do, and bam, look at what it did right there. This was actually at it's the equivalent exposure of about f11, okay? I shot it at f1.8, but one four thousandths of a second. But for, a re rel a, a, for you to know the brightness, I, I kind of put the relative f-stop as if you were putting the shutter speed and the ISO equal, okay? But a lot of times I like to shoot uh, wide open and blur out my background. So that's why you're going to see very, very high shutter speeds, okay? So you're gonna, I use this light to create that shot. I had the sun behind my subject, as you can see as it's lighting up the hair, but I, I, but I limit the light so much into my camera that I, and, and this light is so powerful that I was able to take an exposure with, without really blowing out anything, okay? If you had a normal video light, your backgrounds would be all blown out at this point. You wouldn't see any background because the light is so bright, okay? If the sun was beside your subject. Check this situation out here, okay? I'm using these Stella lights here, and I am shooting the equivalent of F16. Look at my specs, on, I'm not lying. I'm shooting at 1.8 at 8 thousandths of a second. If you did an equivalent exposure, and you turned my ISO to 100 and my shutter speed to 100 and changed my f-stop to give me the exact same exposure, you would have to turn your f-stop to f16, okay? So this is pretty much the brightest light situation that you will run, onto, run, run into being on Earth. Now, if you go to Mars, I'm not quite sure what the situation is there, but for Earth, f16, if, if you can conquer F16, you can do some stuff. You don't have to worry. All right? And again, I was using the CLA X8 8000 with no diffuser. In fact, we have these Fresnels that concentrate the light. And to me, they make the light stronger. And so I would have that 8000 lumens and put this on top of it so it would be even brighter in order to get me that F16 with the light. You want to see how bright it is? I'll shine it down, how's that? <laughs> you know, it's pretty darn bright, okay? So you can see on the wall, right? It's pr that's pretty darn bright, okay? And these things are so awesome too, because when you turn them on, it tells you how many minutes of battery that you have left according to that strength that you're shooting at. So I really love that feature because I can tell when I'm running out of juice. And if I ever need more, you'd always get a D-tap. They sell this. It's very, very popular in the video world where you can plug this in, your D-tap, on the side here, and then power these up. And so you could get extra time. So you could always get more time out of them if you need to. But uh, usually for me, from a still photographer, um, I never... I never was at a case where I ran out of battery power. Okay, let's go on. Here's another one, right? Bright light situation, straight, not even diffused light, okay? Not even diffused. Um, I'm at a F11 here, okay? Showing you that in bright light situations, I can now use constant light, which is amazing. I've never been able to do this before, before these lights. Never, and so it's really revolutionized my shooting. 
Okay, here's another bright light situation. I'm in Hawaii here, and you can see somebody holding the light, and the sun is shining directly back into my camera. I kind of like that lens flourish feel. There's a little bit of cloud coverage, but pretty much that light is still at full strength. Uh, and so that's the light, that's the shot that I got out of it using the Stella light in that bright light situation. Now what is it? Check out the, uh, it's basically, again, I'm at shooting at 1.8, but my shutter speed is pegged at 8,000. So you know, like even natural light shooters know, if you're shooting at your low aperture and you're shooting at 8,000th of a second, you know that it's very, very bright, right? Natural light shooters know that because they're always trying to shoot a lot of times at low f-stops and they, we just need that like shutter speed all the way at the top, okay? So the equivalent exposure is the f-16, okay? The brightest light that you're going to have to ever overcome and it's doing it right there, okay? With the CLX-8 and then also I had the Fresnel on top of that to give me a little bit of oomph on it, okay? Here's another situation. Oh, well, what happens if you're shooting a couple, okay? And so again, you can see the sun. It's very, very bright. I'm shining that light on my subject. Okay, what's my, my, my uh, I'm shooting at F8 here at 1 60th of a second, ISO 100. So, you know, I'm kind of at F10 range, F11 range. But if you look at this photo, this is the style. Anybody use MagMod? Are you guys familiar with magma? Now, one of the popular things that they put on the flash is what they call a grid. And so a lot of times, wedding photographers use that because they'll take their flash, they'll put the grid on, and it'll concentrate that light just in an area. And so they'll fire it at the couple, and then the light will fade off. So you just see the couple's faces, the most brightest. And, and it's a very popular style of shooting. And this is exactly like that same style. Where is the camera over there? Where, what do you mean, where is the camera? The position of the camera. Oh, oh well. The light. The, the light, okay. I always, I always put the nose to the light, okay? And so if the nose is to the light, right, it would be off here, right? Because the reason why I do that, I'm not going to show you right now. Here's a, here's a simple rule that will keep you out of trouble in shooting in bright light. Always put the nose to the light because this is what happens, okay? Let's use some very bright light, okay? I don't care nuking my eyes out for you guys, okay? So this, this, this light's pretty bright, right? Now, what happens if I don't put the nose to the light? What happens? What's the brightest part? You got a lovely shot of my ear, probably, right? And, and so this is in shadow, is that correct? Right, and so you're, if you take a photo like this, you're gonna have to do a lot of Photoshop to bring this out, and a lot of times it's gonna look unnatural. So when you're shooting in bright light, if you always keep the nose towards the light, what's the brightest part of the image? The face. Right? And so your eye goes to what is brightest and what is sharpest. So that's why a lot of portrait artists like using fast lenses to blur the background out because that makes their subject the sharpest and your eye will immediately go to it and create impact. But not only is that, is if you use lighting too and you make the lighting the bright, the face the brightest, your eye is really, really going to go to it first. Okay, so if you're in a very bright light situation and you don't have that nose to the light, you, you, just, you just cause yourself a lot of work in Photoshop or it might not even be usable at all, okay? And so you wanna stay out of that situation. So I have this simple rule called nose to the light. I've become famous with that saying, right? And it, it's a simple thing, but it makes sure when you're shooting outdoors, that you've got the proper light. Okay, so anyways, good question about the light positioning. Okay, and you can see the shadow, right? And so the nose towards the light, I have them looking away because I want that contour on their cheek. You see the highlight and you see the shadow? That gives the face shape. And I'm always wanting to do that with my portraits. 
So that's why I always, with the, that's called short side shadow, I'm always wanting to create that. And if I have a very strong light source, I can create that anywhere I go, depending on the lighting situation. Okay? Now that's, that's the first, did anybody have questions about bright light? About overcoming it and how much power is needed and all that? No. Okay. Let's go into situation number two. Okay? So in situation number two, um, this is from like F8 to F4, which means you're basically in overcast light or open shade. Like you're in shade, but the sun is still out and it's relatively bright. What is, your, what is the gear to use? Uh, mostly CLX8. St the Stella 2000 might be able to get you to F4, F5, 6 but it's not really going to get you to F8. So it's, Stella 2000 is usable uh, in this situation, but I, I primarily lean on still on the CLX8. That's the, that's the one I need. Okay? All right. So let's go and look at this, this type of situation. Okay? Uh, here's a shot here. Right? It's overcast, obviously. Right? It's in California, but it's still bright. Even though it's overcast, that is still a ton of light. The average video light will not even make a difference in this situation. You can't even use it, even though it's overcast. And so you see how I got those catch lights in her eyes, right? Uh, and I'm kind of creating some shadow. And so what happens with overcast light, what's so unpleasant? Even though the light is so even on overcast, light is coming from what? Above right? It's really soft, but it, it's still strong because it's F8. What happens a lot in overcast weather is you're going to still get raccoon eyes because the light is still coming from above. And so you think, oh wow, it's overcast, it's even lighting, I can just shoot, you know, willy-nilly, wow, do everything. No. If you look at the photos, you're still going to get raccoon eyes at F8. And so that's why in the shade and even in overcast, I still add light. This is why I still had to have light here because that's what exactly was happening. I was getting raccoon eyes still at F8. So I just take my flash, uh, my uh, CLX8, turn it on full power with no diffuser. I fired that in there. Yes. Shallow. Yes. Here's the settings right there. So when I say F8, that means the equivalent exposure of F8. I'm still shooting at what? 1.8? But I pegged it at eight thousandths of a second. So if yeah, you were to shoot this. Yeah, that's fine. I'm not. That's what you need. Yeah. You want them to be in, in the background. Right. In the background. Yes. Yes. So that's what I love doing, is I love shooting at shallow depth of field because your eye goes to what? What is sharpest and what is brightest. And so that's why a photo can have impact like this, uh, because I love shooting depth of field. And so this is at 1.8 with a 55 millimeter lens. So it'll blur the background out, and then I can just go in with my light. But I don't want, I want to, I want to keep things relative here of how you, how you know how much light strength I need. And so I'm just telling you it's the equivalent of F8 if your ISO was at 100 and your shutter speed was at 100. Okay? This is manual or eye focus? Me? Oh, I use a Sony. So I use eye focus. Yeah, the best focusing, best focusing system in the world, by the way. I'm so glad they just came out with their new uh, A7R4, which everybody should buy too. 61 megapixels, right? Yeah, but who's using 61 megapixels? I do. I love it because I like to crop out. I might just want to get a snail in this photo, uh, shoot it like at F16 and just get the snail. That's my option. Or the ant that's crawling on the ground. That's why I, I probably need a hundred megapixels, actually. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah. No, you know what's you know what's great about uh, yeah, it won't matter here. But what's what's great about the 61 megapixels on the new camera, if you use an APS-C lens, you can still get 26 megapixels on an APS-C with that camera. So you don't have to change camera lenses and buy full frame. Yeah. So yeah. So you can still you don't have to buy all full frame. But we're getting off subject here. <laughs> Okay, got to keep this guy in check here. Man, all right, so here I am using the CLXA. Okay, here's another situation, kind of overcast. This is kind of F11. It's not really a solid F8 because the sun was still poking through the clouds and it was getting brighter. And so basically I say it was about F10, maybe F11, but I'm still shooting it at 1.8. And so this has plenty of power. Do you think I diffused the light or not? No, I didn't diffuse it. It still looks great, right? It still looks great. Okay, even this one, I didn't diffuse it. You can tell, look at the shadow under her arm. Is it sharp or soft or feathered? It's pretty sharp, right? Like the shadow under her chin. Is it sharp or is, is it soft? No, it's pretty, that's why you know I'm using hard light there. Okay, but it still works, yes. How close is the light? It's like yesterday, right? It's pretty close. I, I try to keep it within four feet or so, right? Um, and I get it pretty close. Um, so that's why, um, anyways, I, you still need a lot of juice at F8. Like there's no other constant portable light in the world that can do this shot. None other, okay? You try getting your little video light out that you have. If it's not light motion light, you will it will be, you won't even see if it's turned on or not. Just go outside and turn your video light and see what kind of effect it has. It has zero, right? Uh, so this is, is amazing. This is a new category that's shooting in that I've never been able to do before. And so that's why if you're a wedding photographer, for sure you should get these because you could just run around using this light instead of setting up your flash and all that. It's like running gun, right? All right. Here's that one, here's that shot, okay? Now, this shot for sure wouldn't be possible with a flash. How do you think I took this shot and why do you think flash would not work for me on this shot? So, what happened, okay, so I got them posed, I got them kissing, and I'm throwing the, I'm having, the group is throwing rose, the bridal part, party is throwing rose petals over them. So am I going, okay, throw the rose petal, click one shot, and then I'm done with it? What do you think I'm doing to make sure that I got the perfect shot? So like some rose petals are going over their face and you don't want to get that. So you want the perfect one where, where it's just the rose petals just past their faces so you can see it. How do you, you think you can get that in one shot? Oh, good. I am putting, oh, yes. I am doing this shot. Not possible with flash because I'm shooting at 10 frames per second. Okay, who owns a flash here? Okay. Okay, if you were to fire your flash, right, wouldn't it take time for it to recycle? Sometimes it takes a whole second or two or three seconds for it to recycle. Is it possible to shoot 10 frames per second with a flash? No. I love the new creativity that I'm being able to do with constant light. I am able to shoot 10 freaking frames per second. And yes, I'm buying more memory cards, but they're cheap. But I'm getting the exact shot I want. It is improving the quality of my shots because I have more choice now. Especially, anybody shoot somebody when the wind is bl blowing and the hair is going all over the place? Now what I do, 10 frames per second. I get that perfect one with the hair just perfectly quaffed out. Bam! You're going to love it. I can see you getting one or two of these lights, actually. I'm gonna, I got a discount for you too. I got I got a discount for you too. 
Especially if you own an A7 III, you gotta get these lights. Okay, so see how amazing that is? Is shooting multiple frames per second. Here's my setup here, uh, my settings. I'm at 5,000th of a second there, very, very high. Shooting shallow depth of field, right? Um, and so, you know another thing is too? Um, I have these flashes that I have by another brand. And a lot of times when you shoot, um, when you shoot like uh, at a high shutter speed, high speed sync, what you're doing is you're really overworking your flash. It's, it's firing multiple times uh, when you're shooting in high speed. Your flash overheats a lot. And so when you're shooting for 10 minutes straight at, at high speed sync, your flash will stop working. Okay? So now with this, this continuous light, it doesn't it doesn't stop after 10 minutes, you know? Like, I think you can get an hour at, at, at full uh, 8,000 lumens or whatever, whatever it's at, right? Two hours straight, no overheating, right? Especially a lot of times I will go and do workshops where I'm having 10, 20 people shooting at the same time. If we have to share a trigger, I guarantee you, your flash will overheat, right? Sometimes I'm with workshops where 50 people you want to try trading triggers with 50 people? That flash is working, working, where it overheats. Well, when I use my Stella lights on these workshops, no problem, okay? And so that's, that's an amazing thing about it. So there's a lot of advantages with constant light, okay? Here we were yesterday. Who was there? Raise your hand. Okay, this is straight out of camera now. I didn't have time to edit. But here I wanted to put us in a super bright situation, okay? And with bright light coming behind, and let's see if we could fill her with soft light going forward. We put this uh, little Ellen Chrome. Now, the CLX has an Ellen Chrome mount built right on here, so you can easily attach it onto uh, the light here. See that? Boom, fits. And so this is what we use. And not very big, right? It's, oh, well, it's not a great soft box, big, huge one but can it produce quality light, right? If you get it close like that, uh, let's see what it can do, right? So, right, that's pretty soft light there, shooting into bright light situation, um, and we're able to get some nice catch lights, look at the highlights and shadow on her skin, um, and it's beautiful light, even from a small soft box like that. Just get it close to your subject, okay? All right. Now, let's talk about motion again. Because of this light, I'm able to do more creative things, like the falling shot, right? So I wanted her to kind of fall forward on the rocks, right? But I needed a little bit of light to create some contrast on her face, because it was all overcast, OK? and. Um, it, it, it had some raccoon eyes, and I needed to get that light into her face to take out that overcast raccoon eyes in the face. So I need, so here, I was actually using just the Stella 1000, just a small little light, okay? And so I'm able to do this shot here. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, I should have had that where you can actually see the shot. <laughs> Sorry, but uh, I think I changed the picture, so I, I forgot to take that out. But anyways, I could change it right now. Do you, want, you understand what the picture looks like, right? But you can see with the Stella 1000 here, you could see even with that small light outdoors, I still was able to get highlight and shadow on her cheek. And that's what I was looking for. And that little light did it for me. Okay, so even with the Stella 8000, I was outdoors. It wasn't super bright light. It was it's very dark because uh, it was, um, you know, almost looked like it was going to rain. Uh, so it was very low light, but still, I was able to use the Stella 1000. Okay, here's another shot. Okay, beautiful portrait, soft light, because you can tell because the shadow, look at the shadow on her nose and the transi transition between the shadow and her, the highlight. It's very soft, right? Uh, and it's not sharp. And so I'm using, again, this CLX-8 with a softbox, that Ellen Chrome softbox. That's all I'm using, that small little softbox. 
and it's being able to create very beautiful professional quality portrait, right? It looks, it's very professional. That light looks very soft. All right, here's another situation. I'm, I'm going and I'm, I'm setting up this light because she's in the car looking through the windshield, but you can see it's overcast light. So there wasn't a lot of light coming in and the light was very flat. And again, uh, the light wasn't pleasant around her eyes. So I just needed to bump up the light to create some contrast, the highlight and shadow on her face. So I'm setting this light up and you know what happens all the time is everybody gets into my spot whereas I was going to shoot but I was setting the light up right so that happens I set up especially a workshop so I'll set it up and then people run into my spot and I can't even get to the spot that I want to shoot but anyways let me show you the results after I kicked them out the you know what the about the reflection good question good. are you ready Oh wait, I wanted to say something too. When you use constant light, you can have multiple shooters at the same time, not like flash. You could even have video people. And now a lot of times, nowadays you have to send a still crew and a video crew, but you can use the same lighting. And that's really cool for wedding photography. Okay, now he's worried about the, who else is worried about the reflection? Anybody else really worried about the reflection besides this gentleman? Well, guess what? I just went with the reflection. I embraced the reflection. I said, I'm going to do an artsy fartsy shot with the reflection, but I need some light into her eyes to make it work. And so you could see there, do you see that sparkle in her eye? And so you see that, okay, the important thing, do you see the highlight and shadow on her cheek? If I didn't use that light, I wouldn't get that highlight and shadow, which to me really makes the portrait, is that difference of that shaping of her face, okay? Here's another picture. I'm just going with that reflection. That's why I shot through there, but I still needed some light on her face, okay? So I do that a lot. Sometimes I'll shoot through reflections. Sometimes I'll shoot through shadows. I do the same thing with shadows. Okay, all right, so um, here it is. I'm at about uh, shooting at one thousandth of a second at 1.8. The equivalent exposure is about 5.6. There is no video light, portable video light on the market that is that strong that could get 5.6. There's it's not, not even existent. So if I were to do this shot, I would probably have to use a flash. Uh, to do it if I didn't have these uh, uh, light and motion. And then also, these four other guys wouldn't have got the shot either, right? So that's the amazing thing. This was yesterday, right? Straight out of camera. I didn't even edit this. I didn't have time. But we're shooting in the shade, right? Shade according to our chart is 5.6. If you want to shoot in shade, it's 5.6, right? And so, but we used, what, what was the setup here? What were we shooting in this? Here? We were shooting this, right? But was it through a softbox or it was direct? Do you guys remember when we were shooting that? Yes, because you can see the transition. There's not a lot of sharp shadow on there, right? So we just took this and we shot through this to get this shot. And what this was able to, in flat light, what I love about in a flat light, I'm able to get the highlight and shadow. Cool, that's the best thing about your portraits. If you can create highlight and shadow on your portraits, they're gonna look amazing. And that's why what's cool about shooting with a person that has dark skin is you actually get to see the highlight and shadow. And so that's why if you're a portrait artist, you know, we love to shoot dark skin because if you're good at lighting, you could get that highlight and that shadow and that tone and it looks like their face and their body is glowing because you can really see it. Now if you shoot a person that has light colored skin, it's harder to get that uh, highlight and shadow, all right? So that's why you see a lot of times when you win awards for portraits, it's usually a person with dark skin 
that they always win those high awards is because just the nature of it, you can see the highlight and shadow in the lighting. All right? Okay. Create highlight and shadow in flat light. That is the coolest thing, right? And doing it with a video light and not having to do it with a flash. Okay? Again, using the CLX8. And again, there it is. It's the equivalent of uh, 5.6 uh, light, right? I am shooting it at 1.8 though. So that sunny 16 rule really works. You can go out and guess the exposures by understanding that you could actually figure out the exposures just by looking at your lighting situation. All right, here's another way to use the, uh, the constant light. I like using it a lot of times as backlight to give me some rim light. As you can see, it's over to the left. This is the BTS shot, okay? So I'm using that strong light to give me some rim light, but I'm using a, the door. This is a hanger to an airplane uh, hanger. Uh, to get let that light come in and be a huge softbox because it was overcast, right? And so that's my main light is, is that light coming in uh, to my subjects, but I am using a video light to give me a backlight, and here's my resultant shot. Doesn't that look beautiful, right? So I got all the catch lights and everything from that soft light coming in the door, and you can tell it's soft because if you look at the one girl on the left, and look at the shadow under her chin. Is it sharp or is it soft, the shadow? It's very soft, right? So that soft light coming in that huge door, it's, OK? And, but then I'm using my video light just to create that rim around them, which really looks a sophisticated look. But it's so easy to do. You just turn it on and fire it. That's it, and start shooting. And so that's the cool thing about constant light. If you're just new to lighting, this is the way to go because you're going to start to be able to create these complex looks very easily. OK, so there's my camera settings for all those who want my settings. Um, I'm shooting at uh, f2 at uh, 1600 of a second at ISO 400. All right, using the CLX-8. Okay. Now, wedding photography. I just did this like, uh, man, was it just last week? I can't remember. I do so many things. I think the wedding was last week. So anyways, I, I had this idea of using the CLX for my first dance. And I, you know, I love using the CLX with the first dance. And there's one thing, though. You got to put the Fresnel on it. Why is that when I'm doing the first dance? Because I just want that light pinpointed on my subject. If I were to use a typical video light that's like in a box, right? That light would spread all around. And in this photo, you would see, you know, the, the entire audience would be lit up too, right? But here, when you just do it like this and you put the Fresnel on, It'll just pinpoint that light right on your subject, and you can isolate them. And so what I did was, they actually were going to first dance in this area. And I said, no, 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 you can't do it there. In this, it, this actually was a, a reception that was like uh, at 2 PM in Los Angeles, bright light, OK? They had a, uh, what do you call, sunroof in the reception area. So I told them to turn on, to, to close all the curtains. But I couldn't eliminate all the ambient light because they had this one skylight there. But the amazing thing, so a lot of times with wedding photography, you just got to go with what you got, right? That's not my normal situation because that bright light coming down from there was throwing me off because that's not my normal situation. But I went with it. I said, hey, let me use that light to light them up, and then I'll use my light to create a backlight. I told them to dance in that skylight area. Because they wanted to dance over here. It was darker over there. I go, no, you dance right in that area. I guarantee you the photos are going to look amazing. Oh, OK. So go out there and dance. And so now you can see that beautiful light coming down on them. And then the Stella light, I mean the CLX, uh, creating that great rim light around them uh, with that ambiance. And this is such an easy way to do um, your first dance shots. 
uh, we all got amazing shots. I didn't have to trade any triggers or I didn't have to worry about, you know, another, because I had four other photographers with me shooting it because it was a real wedding workshop. And if we all had triggers using the same lights and stuff like that, it, you couldn't have been able to do this. But because it's constant, the video like the videographer could do it, all my other photographers could shoot at the same time, and we wouldn't have to worry about stealing each other's light. Okay, so here's my settings was I was shooting at 2500th of a second at ISO 400 or the equivalent of about f4 worth of light coming down onto my subjects. Okay, and so here's that. I put that light, positioned that light so it was directly behind him so I wouldn't see it on this shot. And it almost looks like a heart right there, the way they're holding their hands and everything. Right? It's, it's, it's a great wedding, great couple. All right, but that's how you can do um, your first dance, just with that. No more flash, just turn it on. Give yourself some beautiful rim light. All right, so let's talk over the last situation. Right, and then if you have any questions at the end, uh, or I can talk a little bit about the modifiers and things like that, about in particular of the different lights uh, a little bit later, because it looks like we're going to have some time left over. All right, so um, let's talk about the last situation. Now, this is shooting in very low light, which means what? When the sun goes below the horizon, or you're indoors, okay? And so here's my technique. You can use all three lights at this case. Pre, uh, I would, you know, say the one, you can use the 1000, but you, it only has a burst for like say 45 seconds. Uh, so you gotta be careful with that. Uh, so if you wanna use it prolonged amount of time, uh, probably the Stella 2000 is probably a, a better option for you, but for sure the CLX8 can do it. And now with the CLX8, they lowered it so it can go down to even 500 lumens if you need it in very, very low light situations. So here's what I, how I love taking low light pictures, okay? This is when the sun goes below the horizon or indoors, okay? Use a very fast lens. I like using 1.8 or faster. Sometimes my, my 20, I use my 24 millimeters, 1.4. But I love using 1.8 because I want that blurred background. Okay, and either a 50 millimeter or even 85 millimeter might even look better with this technique, and I'm and I'll tell you why, and I'll show you why. And then first you meter for your background. Okay, I look for when I'm shooting at night. I am looking for lights in the background. Okay, I am looking for colored lights, uh, a sunset or, you know, whatever, but I'm looking for lights, okay? I take that light, whether I'm using the 1000 or the 2000. Now, the 1000 or the 2000 has an umbrella mount uh, mounted to it. And these things, everybody should have a, uh, an umbrella. They're very inexpensive. They're very fast to set up, faster than a softbox. And they're very, very effective. And if you lose them, who cares? Right, and so you can always shine the light through this umbrella to get very, very soft light. Um, and I use that a lot. So either 1000 or 2000 use the umbrella. The CLX has softbox options if you want to use it with a softbox. Okay, so I diffuse the light, and then I place the light as close as possible to the subject. Right, as I told you, then I choose a background with lights like or a colored sunset or guess what sometimes I create my own lights in the background okay and I'll show you examples of all these of how I do it okay all right so I, I'll especially uh, after this when I'm gonna demo the product I'm gonna do a bunch of fun stuff I'm gonna use some colored light I'm gonna use some shadow patterns and stuff like that to create some Hollywood looks so we'll, we'll have some fun with it okay look at this shot Okay, I'm looking for those lights in the background. Okay, and what did I use? I used a Stella 1000, okay, right here, right? And I got this uh, pop-up softbox, 
I'm not sure. Uh, you can see a B&H has it here. And right, and so this light can pop up and create a so Can I have a lovely model come up for one second? And I'm going to show you how easy it is to create light like this through this little soft box. So if she could just stand right here now and look towards that audience right there, right? And I could just create this light instantly like this with the 1000. This is a little portrait. It's so fast. Thank you very much. Isn't she beautiful? All right, okay. This is so fast to create a portrait anywhere. Boom. Anybody. Just turn it on. This pops in and, and you're off and racing. And that's what I, exactly what I used right there. And it's not very big, but if I get it close to my subject, it's going to look amazing. Right? I don't expect it to look great if you know, you're there and I'm here. That probably won't work. Right? But if I could just get right there and do it, boom. So anytime you want to take a portrait, quick and easy, you can get one of these pop-up soft boxes, put it through a Stella 1000, bam, you're off to the races. Okay? So here's another one. I've, I've got an event. I live in California. They've got the best sunsets in the world sometimes, right? So I, I didn't dream this up, folks. I didn't, like, this is not a plaster sky. This is the real McCoy. I was like, oh my gosh. Like, if you're a photographer, you're like, oh my, lucky stars, right? And so I'm shooting it. Uh, I'm putting, uh, I'm metering for the background. It's got that beautiful uh, sky in it. They're dark, right? But I'm putting my uh, video light uh, on them. I'm using a, an umbrella there, and I'm getting these shots so easy without flash. Okay? And I'm just using that video light to, to do it, and it's creating an amazing shot very easily without even thinking. It's so easy. Okay? I'm using the CLX-8 here. Here's another one. It's a, now this is just a, this is like a Stella 2000 through an umbrella, okay? What did I do? This is a city street with, there's, there's those things that you see in the background are traffic lights and, and like cars and whatever, okay? So I take, a, I think it's a 85 millimeter lens at 1.8 and that's why you want to use at least 55 millimeters because you want those lights to get big like that right and so the longer the lens that you use the bigger those lights in the background the closer they appear to the camera it's called compression compression means the background looks like it's getting closer it's being compressed so the longer the lens that you use the more it compresses the wider the lens you use the more it decompresses and looks like it's far away from you. So you use a, a little, and then you get this shot. This is just right in the middle of the street, okay? I do this a lot, and it's so easy. You just shine your, get your Stella 2000, put it through an umbrella, light them up, and you notice it's off camera a little bit because I can get that highlight and shadow on her cheek. I'm looking for that, right? So I create a little bit of shadow right there. Uh, looks great. Here's another one. Again, you could use your Stella 2000, put it through an umbrella. What do you meter for? You meter for your background first, Those, that neon, colorful. You look for something that's lit up, okay? You meter for that. Your subject is dark. You just bring your light in, and you just move it in as close as you, know, you need to be until the exposure is right, and then you shoot the picture, and boom, you're off to the races. It's that easy. Here's another one, same thing. Here you can use a Stella 2000 through an umbrella. I did the same technique. Maybe this is a 55 millimeter lens instead of an 85. I'm not quite sure. Uh, but it's either one of those two. And look at the lights in the back. I, cho I specifically chose that, those lights in the background. I said, I'm looking for those lights. You know, I had the string lights. I chose that, blurs it out, beautiful shot. This is in Australia. Same thing, I metered for those lights that were behind, she's dark. You can take your Stella 2000, has plenty of juice for this shot, put it through an umbrella, and just put it down on your subject and light, light them up. But you're metering for the background first. 
okay? Because you want those lights behind her to look fantastic. So you set your camera settings so those lights look really, really good. Most likely your subject is going to be really dark or, or have some shadows on it. Then you take your video light, you know, through an umbrella or a soft box and you just bring it close to your subject, you position it the way you want it, you look at the shadows, uh, and then take the picture. It's that easy. Here's it uh, at uh, Paris, okay? You meet her for the background. You take your light, you put it through an umbrella, this is all it was, through an umbrella, and you can light your subjects up. But that's, you could use a Stella 2000 to do that. That's not a problem with that. You don't even, because why? The sun went below the horizon. The sun intensity is very low, so to light something up now is easy, because it's dark. You don't have to fight with any other ambient light, any other shadows thrown by any other light that's existing there. There is no light. So you're creating your light, but you're creating soft light, and uh, you can do it. Okay, now, look at this. I told you they were waterproof, right? So we're in Hawaii there, I have a Stella 2000 on one side, and I have a Stella 1000 on the other, and I said, oh, I want to get this shot uh, by the ocean, and I'm just going to plant these in there, and I don't care if that water's like going all over them, right? People are like, oh my gosh, your lights! Don't worry about it, they can go 100 meters, they're only going 6 un inches under the water, and so I can start to do more creative things like that in the water, and look at the shot that I got. I'm just using up light and there to, to fill in those shadows, right? Look at the highlight and shadow on her cheek, right? I'm getting a slight highlight and shadow. Look at the highlight and shadow on her leg, on her arms. I'm getting definition. I'm, I'm shaping that person by my lighting. If you don't have a highlight and shadow, you don't got a shot. You don't got a portrait, okay? Now, watch this, okay? I got a Stella 1000, I'm in Jamaica here, uh, shooting a wedding there, and I'm putting it underneath the pool, okay? And this is creating some awesome uplight because the water is rippling, right? And so it's creating this kind of varied look on their face, and it's not just solid light, but it has a very, kind of uh, mysterious and romantic feel to it. I've got a Stella um, CLX in the back giving me some awesome backlight, right? And here's the shot that I got from using those. Isn't that beautiful? See how when you shine the light through the water, it's not gonna, it's gonna give that ripply effect of shadows on their face, okay? And then we had some dude, uh, we had a friend just like splash water in the back so I could get that shot next. I couldn't do that without the Stella lights of the under, being able to put them underwater. But it was so easy to do. So easy to do. And now it's just allowing me to be more creative to do different things. Uh, because it's constant light, I can shoot at 10 frames per second, I can put it in the water and do different stuff now, and just have fun, you know? We're not going to do that downstairs, not unless they put a pool in for us, but uh, I would otherwise, okay? CLX-8 in the back and a Stella 1000 underneath, giving me that up light, okay? All right, what's that? What's with your ISO then? Uh, my ISO? Um, I don't know. It's probably going to be like, I can find out. You want me to find out? Let's do that. I have that picture right there, and we can, we can search that out. Uh, oh, wait. Let's get rid of that. Okay, don't get mad at me because my laptop has tons of files on the top. I'm not a very neat person. Okay, let's find that darn picture. Here it is, right here, right? Here it is. It says I shot it at 1 60th of a second at 1.8 at ISO. Where's the 
Where does it say the ISO there? 1250 at about 1,000, OK? All right. So that's not bad, 1,000, right? You can do it. All right, so I love doing it for detail shots. Uh, for weddings, I have to shoot a lot of like details like rings. It's no good getting your flash out. It's very easy to use your video light, a strong video light. And so what I like to do is get that light from behind, OK? So I get the light from behind so I can um, get that light coming through the diamond. And in front, I buy those like little mini string lights. And I'm going to do that. I'm going to shoot some portraits like that today where I put these little string lights in front of my lens so I can get those light effects. But I do it for portraits too, and we're going to do it downstairs. See that? See these little lights? I put that right in front of my lens when I shoot it to get that effect. All right, so we'll do that downstairs. OK? All right. Um, so I'm using only the Stella 1000 here. Very portable, very strong. Just get up and at it. OK, here's the cool thing about using constant light at a wedding when it's outdoors. OK, there's a very, it's hard to shoot an event outdoors if you're using lighting because of what a lot of people do is they tell you to buy a flash and put some sort of Tupperware thing on it or whatever to diffuse the light, right? That's what they tell you to do. The reason why it works is because the light is hitting the ceiling, coming back down huge, and it looks great, OK? Now you're shooting an outdoor vent, and you got your little flash with the little thing on it, right? And you fire it. It goes up. Where's it reflecting to? Nowhere. So what we learned was the effective light is how big the source is. So when you use that thing, all you're doing is using a source this big. So when you're outdoors with that apparatus, it looks terrible because you're using a light source this big. So what I do is I set up my Stella 2000 or 1000, usually, uh, well, or the CLX8 2000, right? And I could use this, easily use that for this shot. Look how big this light source is now, right? So if I shine this light through this, this is much better than the thing you would put on top of your flash. Look how big the light source is, right? Look how beautiful that light is, right? It just creates beautiful light. And so now I'm not depending on that light to ricochet anywhere, right? Uh, and so when you're outdoors, I can get beautiful light at all times. And I, what I love doing is, and I also give other people who are using their iPhones for getting the best photos in their life. So I'm setting the lighting up for them. So what I do is I, they're over here, right? I just set up my light stand here. I put the video light on it, through it, right? And now do you see highlight and shadow on their faces? The dimension. If I used on-camera flash, how would this photo look? Sorry, I'm kind of peeking out there. Terrible, because look at it would get rid of all that flash that you see, the highlight and shadow, right? You know, you, and it's for, especially for wedding photography, I'm going to tell you a little secret. Every woman in the world thinks their arms are too big, OK? <laughs> so how do you make them look smaller? Highlight and shadow, OK? You're using on-camera flash. You're not going to get any highlight and shadow because it's on-camera flash. You would totally ruin the atmosphere of this shot. Right? It looks like a spotlight's coming down on it. I just create the spotlight wherever I want to go. And so this is great if you're doing event photography, you're doing wedding photography. I always do this for the cake. I just set up my light, put it down, shine it. I get some nice off-camera lighting. Okay? Better than on-camera flash. Look at, look at the lighting I get. On-camera flash would totally ruin the lighting of that. And that's the reason why I get paid a lot of money for shooting weddings is because I really know how to do my lighting quickly and fast, okay? 
All right, here's another low light situation. The sun is below the horizon. It's getting real, real dark, but you know, we still want to shoot like photographers. You know, what's our famous saying? One more, one more, one more, one more, right? Okay, this is a one more situation. We're supposed to go back uh, into the camera store and buy a whole bunch of stuff, but no, we're still out shooting. What did I do? Take that, uh, that, that CLX-8, put it through a big umbrella. What kind of shot did I get at the end? Look how beautiful that is. Nose to the what? Light and I can get that highlight and shadow on her cheeks. I could define her face, okay? I could get uh, shadow, highlight and shadow on her, the shape on her body. It looks real beautiful. Okay, here's a situation where I'm using, and we're gonna try to do this uh, downstairs also, where, uh, I'm using constant light as my main light source, but I want the background to have a different feel. So I've got my gels and I put different color lights in my background. And I, I envision this kind of low key image, which means a lot of l low tones, but dark, not very bright, right? That uh, low key means mostly dark tones but there's still contrast and lighting that you can see things, okay? And so th I got this next shot from there, right? So I'm adding gels to my lighting in the back, but that's the photo that I got. So it was a constant light, right, through an umbrella. You could, uh, that 2000 through the umbrella, and then gelled. Uh, I, in this case, I used flash. You had to stick your flash on very, very low power, like maybe 132nd power, 164th power, something like that, right? And then uh, you use your main as your video light and you can create shots like that. Now here, I didn't see any color lights in the background, so I just made my own, okay? That is the great thing about really knowing your lighting is you can create the drama and the motion and the look that you want from a lighting perspective. You can just create it yourself, okay? There's my camera settings for that. All right, so let's review here. If you're shooting in a very low light situation, the sun is, goes below the horizon, you can use any of those lights, they'll work. But uh, if you're gonna go into something where you're shooting into shade, you're shooting into overcast weather, you're gonna need to step up and get the 2000 or the CLX-8. The 2000 will maybe get you to five, six with the Fresnel on, maybe it won't get you to quite to F8 for the CLX will. And then if you're shooting in the super bright situations, you want to get the bad boy, the CLX-8, the, the light that everybody wishes they had, right? But you can own it today because we're going to give you a discount, right? And look, it's small, it's portable, okay? Um, if you need to get a hold of me, um, you can just text 555-888 with the message SRL. It'll come back with a link that even has my own cell number on it. You could try it right now and call me and my phone will ring wherever it is, right here, okay? Uh, you could, uh, don't expect me to answer it, but you can text me. I usually answer my text, so you could text me. Uh, I have all links there to my workshops and my portfolio and all that kind of stuff, all right? Um, I am going to, we have a few minutes left, and if anybody, uh, yes, question. Couple of questions. Couple questions. Surprise, surprise. Real estate. Real estate, yes. I'm in real estate and I'm taking uh, indoor pictures. What's your camera settings? Do you know I'm your camera uh, settings? I'm waiting for my uh, new Tamron 17 to 28. Uh huh. But you don't know what camera settings you shoot at those at, that at? Well, I'm asking about this uh, light. That's why I'm asking the camera settings because I have to see what settings are you using to recommend what light you should use. So, because I don't shoot real estate. A, 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 a set aperture and uh, I'm changing the HR, HR to get the outside. Oh, I see. Okay, so you're shooting like five exposures at once and mashing them together? 
Yeah, I mean, as long as you get some light in there and it's even, I'm not quite sure, you know, the situation, but uh, you'd probably have to, you know, usually get a few lights because you have to light different areas of the, the house, right? I'm not sure. Do you use any light right now? You, it's, sometimes you just want to, like, sometimes some parts of the house are dark. Yeah. Up and down, right? Yeah. And I guess it depends how big the room is and, and whatever. I would have to see more about the camera settings and I would have to know about what, where, how you're shooting it and how much difference you're, how much area you're shooting. Would it make a difference on the lights you're going to use? Because like some of these small apartments, you need a real wide angle to be able to get that, you know. Well, it just, it's not about the, the lens, how wide it is. It's about how much coverage the light has to cover, how much area the light has to cover. You want to light the inside the wall. So you can see How many flashes do you use? Yeah, I use one. I'm not doing it. I'm the broker. I'm not doing it. Okay. Before. So yeah, you might be able to get away with one of these. Um, but I, you know, of course, I'd have to see the camera setting so I can know whether or not well, there's enough good. light. The camera setting I can change according to this. Okay. So the second one is uh, uh, light painting. Light painting. Well, you can do light painting with this, but these are super strong. <laughs> Usually you do light painting with very, very low lights. Well, I saw with, uh, with uh, 2000 with a uh, wall reflector. This one? It's still, this is still kind of bright, but um, oh, a small that, let me show you the lowest setting. Yeah. That's, the, that's the lowest setting. The small reflector. This one? This? Yeah. What about it? You put the light in there. Oh. Uh, and then you, uh, you can move it around and you get a beautiful effect. Behind the subject or on the subject? Behind the subject. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I wouldn't even use this. I would use probably just this. I do that. Uh, you need, uh, I can show you the picture. Oh, OK. Fine. I'm thinking of something different. Good. Well, you're an expert at that. I don't do a lot of light painting. Um, okay. Well, I'm, I'm not a professional. I don't do it for a living, so. Yeah, well, I don't yeah, do light painting for a living either. All, uh, of, of shooting, especially uh, traveling. Good. All right. Great. Um, anybody else have any questions? Yeah. Uh, how big a team do you have and how many lights are you using? Okay, the question is when I'm shooting weddings, uh, how big of a team do I have and how much light, how many lights do I use? All right? Okay. So, in a team, usually if I'm shooting a wedding by myself, I just have me and an assistant. Okay? If it's a special case where my client allows me to uh, turn it into like a workshop where I can invite like no more than four other photographers to come and learn and shoot and it benefits the client because the client gets a lot more coverage and all different angles right and it doesn't cost them any more uh, then in that case you know I have like four people but that's not typical you know what I mean that's a, a different case usually it would just be me and another photographer and maybe one other person um, what do I bring um, you, there's a lot of different things to use uh, and different lighting depending on if it's outdoors or if it's indoors, right? Uh, in general, you could probably get away with uh, like an CLX-8 and a 2000. This could probably do most of your damage right here, carrying this along with you, okay? Um, like I said, when you do the first dance, all you need this and you put this on top right to focus on the on the couple and that's and all you need for that what's that the shot you did in the that we saw were you backlighting with another light or just what was ever with just you? this i was backlighting just with this um right and so you can or but some people use two of those and they cross backlight it 
and you get a little bit more coverage that way. So, um, you know, but I did that one time, but I just did it with uh, Stella 1000s, and I just fired it back, okay? So, um, yeah, you probably would still, like if you're doing some big group shots and things like that, you probably would still use a flash um, because you, flashes are still stronger than video lights, but video lights are starting to catch up now. So video lights are the wave of the future, and pretty soon the video lights will equal the flash power uh, in the future. Um, and there's, but it's just, you know, it's just emerging and starting to get to the point where it's more and more usable. Before, like I said, most of the time when you use a video light, it's only in that first low column, 2.8 and lower, right? Now, these lights allow you to go into overcast, go over into bright light, but it can't do everything power-wise that a flash can do still but it's, it, they're narrowing the gap. And then a lot of people who don't even use flash, this would be a great solution for them because they can get better light now than they, would, they were getting before, but it wouldn't bog them down with technology. And so that's the thing is, is that these lights are constant. It's what you see is what you get. You can start to be more creative. You can design the way you want it because you can just see it right there. And so anybody who doesn't use a lot of lighting, I highly recommend them getting these, these lights. It will improve their photography. Yes? Um, if I'm looking to do more street portraits, yeah. would you recommend, like, you know, handheld, you know, just sort of? Uh, yeah, you can um, definitely, depending on, on the time of day you're doing it. If it's in the, uh, sometimes people just like to bring this either the 1,000, this is so small. They can keep it, and they, they just need a little catch light, or if they need to create some ambient light somewhere and, and stick this somewhere, sometimes this is a great little solution to put in your bag, and it's not that big. So you wouldn't even really need like a sound bar? Um, yeah, well, you can have an umbrella with you if you really need it, and just stick it through there, or you can get one of these. Just these pop down into nothing, right? right. It collapse down into this big, right? So. Um, just in case you want to take a nice portrait of somebody, you can have that. I recommend. A lot of times when I'm doing street photography, an umbrella is great because at times it rains. And so I just use it for an umbrella, which works too. So yeah, good. Any other questions? Thank you for your time, Scott. You got it. All right. <laughs>